I'll be speaking to Yasmin Mather. She's an Iranian exile living in the United Kingdom. She's a member of the editorial board of the journal Critique. She's chairperson of the group Hands Off the People of Iran. Good evening. Good evening. You and your group are rather fierce critics of the regime in Iran, and in fact, you're unable to live there. What do you think of the recent agreement between the Obama administration and the Islamic Republic of Iran? I think the deal um, in some ways marks a new period. That period is um, the time when the United States used the nuclear issue to plan regime change from above. Um, and clearly the Obama administration distanced itself from that position in the last three to four years. Um, it's not a win-win situation, as some people in the Islamic Republic are trying to portray. Uh, for the Iranian people, it's been a disastrous uh, 12 years. Uh, not just um, the US sanctions, but the United Nations sanctions, the banking financial sanctions, the uh, European Union sanctions, the fact that Iranian oil tankers, for example, couldn't be insured and therefore the country couldn't even sell um, oil to a large extent during various periods in the last 12 years. A bankrupt uh, country internally. Having said that, the continuation of the situation would have been worse. So from that point of view, the fact that there is a hope, and let's admit it, it's not finished yet, it's not a deal. We are well aware, and I think Iranians are well aware, that the Republican Senate, the Republican Congress, um, will try and uh, stop this deal uh, in its final stages. But the hope that the sanctions might be lifted, and some of them have already in practice been lifted, uh, gives a level of hope to the Iranian people that the economic situation can get a bit better. And I don't think there can be any doubt. Obviously, the currency exchange rates will be better. Iran is importing a lot of food, a lot of medical equipment, a lot of uh, medicine. Um, there were shortages of those. So from that point of view, there can be no doubt there will be a, an improvement. Having said that, um, what has Iran got in return for this? Uh, a huge amount of money, billions of dollars, have been spent on a nuclear industry that now has to destroy the, the very centrifuges for which the Iranian people not only paid through their national income, but also were penalized in terms of sanctions. Well, uh, let me stop you for a second here. What was the purpose of those centrifuges? I know a couple of years ago when I interviewed you, I asked you the same question. Was it a nuclear power program? Was it a nuclear weapons program? Was it somewhere in between? What do you think? I think the uh, aim was to be nu uh, to to approach a stage where Iran could be a nuclear um, military power without going that far. I think it's very clear. Iran never got anywhere near that, despite all the publicity from the United States, from Israel, from certain sections of the Arab um, states. But Iran wanted to get to a stage where it could use the threat of nuclear weapons, both in terms of uh, maintaining its power, because it was quite clear regime change was, uh, was on the card and remains on the card for many Republicans but also um, in terms of uh, its status in the region, in its competition with local regional powers. So there, I don't think it can be believed that it was simply for um, uh, nuclear energy. Having said that, let me explain that uh, the accusations that Iran, as, a, as an oil country, didn't, it would never need nuclear energy is also redundant. A country can have a policy 
Um, I don't think the Islamic Republic is, is that uh, clever a country as a government, but one country can have a policy of using its um, oil for exports if the price of oil was going up, as it did in the 1990s, in the two, early 2000s, not now when it's falling, and then um, uh, uh, use nuclear for its internal consumption. So the two don't necessarily contradict each other, but I don't think there was such a sophisticated plan in the Islamic Republic. Now, we heard uh, some people say that Iran went to nuclear power uh, because it didn't have enough refineries. And the question then is, why didn't they build refineries? It's not that easy. Okay. One of the biggest refineries was destroyed, Abadan refinery, during the Iran-Iraq war when Saddam's uh, government bombed the place and it caught fire and it was destroyed. That oil refinery, which, as I said, was one of the biggest, well, had been built by the British in the earlier part of the 20th century. Um, spare parts for the existing refineries in Iran were part of the sanctions. Spare parts for a lot of technology associated with the nuclear industry were part of the sanctions. So Iran wasn't easily in a position to build new refineries. Um, I think it's a, there is also a level of short-termism in Iran's economic policies that have often meant looking for solutions to today's problem only as far as tomorrow is concerned, rather than more long-term. Now, we know the Israeli government fiercely opposes the deal. Your site, I don't know if you wrote the article, but it talks about the opposition within Iran uh, the people who oppose the deal, and you call, uh, you are the writer of the article, call it the most corrupt sections of the elite. Could you explain? Okay. A lot of people in uh, and around the regime benefited from the sanctions. It was inevitable that when you have a state that controls parts of the uh, industry, parts of uh, uh, finance sector, banking, and so on, uh, could use the state to bypass the sanctions. So the black markets that flourished during the sanctions period had elements of the government or the conservative factions of the regime and uh, some reformists involved in it. And it is ironic that some of the people who are opposing uh, the deal are the very beneficiaries of these black markets, these flourishing black markets. Um, many of Ahmadinejad's uh, uh, former allies, if you remember the president who um, called the, the sanctions um, not worth the papers they've been written on, and of course many people inside Iran have been mocking this rather crude statement because they suffered. There was no medicine going to Iran, there was no uh, surgical equipment going to Iran, so it was certainly not the question that it was just a piece of paper. But people close to Ahmadinejad, people close to uh, the newspaper Kehan, which is a right-wing conservative Islamic paper, um, have been very strongly opposed to the deal. Having said that, since the deal has uh, been signed in Vienna, clearly the supreme leader and circles close to him have issued um, an order to reduce the level of criticism against the existing deal. So we haven't heard the kind of criticism that dominated these papers, these sections, in the latter part of the negotiations in Vienna. Now, since the agreement was made, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei blasted the US, calling it the ultimate embodiment of arrogance. Uh, but your article claims the regime gave in to this arrogance years ago in the areas of economy, jobs, business. Could you explain? Okay. Um, the Islamic Republic's history, as you know, is the Iranian Revolution. And at that time, the left kept saying we are anti-imperialist. We are against, um, at, in those terms, the terms of the 19, late 1970s, we consider the current system in Iran to be a dependent capitalist system, and we want separation from that. 
Ayatollah Khamenei doesn't want to use in, the word imperialist. He knows the connotations. He knows um, he's intelligent enough to know about at least the title of Lenin's book. And therefore, he uses this term arrogance in order to separate himself from the concept imperialism. But he's deluding himself. Either he's deluding himself or he's a very good liar. Uh, the Iranian government, immediately after the end of the Iraq, Iran-Iraq war, under the, uh, when Rafsanjani was president, gave in to a lot of economic policies that most third world countries have had to, to do. IMF loans, regulations in terms of privatization, neoliberal economic agenda, reduction of the state sector, uh, privatization of major industries. And the Islamic Republic has been a model, according to the IMF, in terms of following up those policies. Once you follow those pol pol policies, you can go on about arrogance, you can give lots of slogans, you can make a lot of uh, sounds about opposing arrogance, but the reality is you are part of that system. And never was it better explained to the world that we are part of that system than during the recent um, sanctions. Because clearly the Iranian economy came to a com almost complete standstill. Uh, the, uh, the network of uh, finance sector was completely throttled because Iran is part of the world economic system, because Iran does require uh, uh, its relations with the IMF, because Iran does follow the diktat of the IMF, even during the time of Ahmadinejad, never mind during the time of Rouhani or Khatami, who are far more open about their support for capitalist international economies. Now, you, you uh, well, the, the, the so-called Islamic Revolution claimed it was going to be a friend of the poor and disinherited, but you say Iran is now one of the area's most unequal societies and riddled with corruption. Yes, I, I think this is one of the, um, if you like, if you look back at what has happened, especially in the last 10, 15 years, but obviously that uh, has a longer history, is that we are seeing an unbelievable gap between the rich and the poor. And this has been picked up uh, both by the Iranian press, but also by the section of uh, European and the US uh, press. Uh, the internet makes that... Uh, um, divide much more obvious because people in the world can go and look at what the rich kids of Tehran are showing on their Facebook pages. They can see the lives of the people who live in South Tehran, the poverty, the devastation, the fact that um, sections of the uh, population are deprived of very basic housing, for example, in Iran. And then we have people who um, flaunt the fact that they ride in personal helicopters or um, buy the latest, the most fashionable uh, sports car. And this is, it, it, despite sanctions, this is, I assume, flown or shipped to Iran for their personal use, is uh, the kind of obvious um, uh, flaunting of wealth uh, in, a, in, a, in such a crude manner that no one can deny this enormous gap between the majority of the population and this minority, many of whom, not all of them, but many of whom, are closely associated with the Islamic Republic, uh, are relatives of um, Ayatollahs. As you know, there is the term in Tehran, people use the sons of Ayatollahs, and, and in this one should add the daughters of Ayatollahs, who have accumulated huge wealth. And I understand there's been a number of uh, corruption trials that put this out in the open. Yes, there are corruption trials, and this is partly because the, the Islamic Republic is not a single man dictatorship. It has many factions. Those factions have differences between them. And the, I suppose as far as we, the opposition is concerned, the good thing is that these factional fightings exposes the corruption of various factions. So during Ahmadinejad time, we had the corruption of Hashemi Rafsanjani and his family, and that's continuing to a certain extent. 
And now we have um, the Rouhani government taking various ministers, uh, allies, deputies to Ahmadinejad to court on billion dollar charges of uh, corruption. The best part is that quite a lot of these people have already moved their money out of Iran. Uh, some of them um, to Latin America, believe it or not. So all the visits that Mr. Ahmadinejad made to uh, Venezuela, Latin America, wasn't simply to show solidarity. Some of it had other intentions quite clearly. Now some of the accounts are found to be there. So is one man, Zan Johnny, closely associated with Ahmadinejad uh, regime, who is now uh, facing uh, corruption charges as far as I know, he owns an airline in one of the um, uh, republics uh, south of Russia. I, I don't want to name it. I, it might be Uzbekistan, but I might be wrong. So yeah. I'm not. Mm. I want to get into another area, uh, the people's rights in Iran. Uh, one of the things is the death penalty. I, I recently posted an article in our Iran archive that said 700 people had been executed this year so far in Iran, and that's shocking. I mean, that's a number far more than Saudi Arabia and the U.S. combined. I think Iran is the second highest in the world, if I'm not mistaken. It's the second highest number of executions. Now, there is two elements to this, and of course, the regime. if you ask the regime, they would tell you they are drug traffickers, child molesters, and so on. First of all, um, uh, trials in Iran should be taken with a pinch of salt. I don't believe in the kind of justice where um, in, uh, the laws of retribution implies that in exchange for a life you can get money, but in other cases where you can't afford to pay, uh, you might get the death penalty. So it really is a very um, subjective system. But most importantly, I think in one of the reasons why we see these executions, and some of them are worse because they are done in public, are to keep the sense of fear amongst ordinary Iranians. And that sense of fear is a deliberate policy of warning uh, those who might think of opposition, those who might consider uh, a form of opposition, that uh, they have to be careful, that they should not they should not seek open opposition. Now, I agree that um, amongst these executed people, most have been non-political, but there have been political executions as well, especially amongst members of the national minorities. I, I know at least of three Kurds amongst those who've been executed who had no criminal case, who were political activists and who were executed for their political activities. I assume there's still thousands of political prisoners, too. There are. And again, Zarif, in an interview in, I think, before Vienna, uh, said Iran has no political prisoners. And I think he came under a lot of attack by even supporters of the Rouhani regime. Um, the problem is that uh, even within the factions of the regime, there is a level of tolerance for, for example, those who call themselves reformists. If you are a reformist, but you are still calling for the release of Musavi from house arrest, you are considered uh, a, an unacceptable reformist. But if you are a reformist who might have sympathies with Musavi, but now are accepting and praising Rouhani and Zarif, you're, you're okay as a reformist. So it's very, um, it, it, it's very meticulous how to decide who, who is accepted and who is not accepted. But of course, if you're people like us who don't want the current uh, state, the current regime, then you should not go back. Or if you do, you should expect to be in prison. How does your group feel about what Iran is doing in Syria? We have never supported Iran's uh, regional ambitions. And um, it is understandable that given the situations that the United States has created in the region, the, uh, i.e. the uh, uh, occupation government in Iraq, which was Shia and then stayed a Shia government, there is a level of opposition to Iran uh, uh, 
fired up by Saudi Arabia, who wants to make Iran look, uh, if you like, an aggressive regional power. And there is an element of truth in the fact that Iran does feel or did feel threatened by this approach. But on the other hand, it is the Islamic Republic also who wants to expand its authority through Iraq, Syria, Lebanon. And there is a truth in the fact that, uh, for example, leaders, uh, cl uh, people close to the leader and other leading figures in the Islamic Republic have said Syria is a province of Iran. And, and this is completely nonsense, historically it's nonsense, but also politically it's a uh, disrespect for the people of Syria, those sections of the population of Syria who don't want a dictator, Assad. Mm -hmm. um, so there cannot be any support, in my opinion, for Iran's position in Syria. But I think we can't simply then fall into the Saudi position of saying um, uh, there are sections of, well, a very small group in Britain who, who, who calls Iran a local imperialist power. And that's an exaggeration. A country uh, devastated by sanctions, um, a, a, what I would call a small uh, um, power in the region, is not an, a local imperialist power. Its ambitions in Syria and Lebanon should be condemned. But on the other hand, it is the United States that has created this terrible situation in the Middle East where we are seeing failed state after failed state without any strategy, any policy. And the people who are gaining from this are the Islamic State, Al Nasr, uh, jihadi groups who um, rely in some ways on mm, not simply the lack of strategy in the, by the US, but rely on the support they are given by allies of the United States, Saudi Arabia and Turkey, Qatar and Gulf countries. What about within Iran? Can you tell, is the intervention in Syria popular? Or do people talk about it openly or quietly? People mainly talk about it quietly. Um, I think most people don't want these types of inter interventions, partly because it isn't there. Um, there is enough of, uh, of most Iranians who can express themselves, for example, in writings, in blogs, to um, on the internet say there are enough problems inside Iran without adding to it by adding the question of Syria, Lebanon, wherever. Yemen, uh, Iran had some intervention in Yemen. Um, there are also those who are close to the regime and who actually think that having a war is a good idea. And this is partly to do with the way the Islamic Republic has survived. The survival of the Islamic Republic has always been of the regime, has been to live within crisis. They actually like living within crisis. And therefore, wars are good because wars create crisis. And the situation in Syria, from that point of view, has an advantage. The advantage being, well, we, we are in a we're in a state of not direct war, but we are in confrontation, and therefore volunteers go. Um, Within the Iranian people, one, we have to admit that there is a section of the population, I can't give you what percentage, but there is a section of the population that still believes in the Islamic Republic and in the Supreme Leader. It's a minority, it is an increasingly small minority, but it exists. Well, finally, I want to get back to the deal. And um, if the deal is not destroyed by the U.S. Congress, do you expect any improvements from the regime in terms of the rights of the people? Unfortunately, I don't. <laughs> and the reasons I don't is that, first of all, we have the precedence. The precedence is the Iran-Iraq war. Iran was forced to accept the resolution of the United Nations. And after that, there was a massacre of political prisoners. Uh, we are not in that situation now. The world is watching Iran and we are not going to see a massacre. But we are not going to see uh, a lifting of the restrictions. We are going to see a more a dictatorial state. 
because we already see it's illegal to criticize the deal inside Iran. Uh, the papers, the newspapers, the media have been given directives. You are not allowed to, you should not publish negative um, comments about this. So you can see that we are not going to see liberalization. But what I fear most are the, if you like, the neoliberal economic policies. Zarif and Rouhani have been promising at least the European countries, and we can see this in the various trips made in the last three, four weeks to Tehran. They have promised these uh, ministers, prime ministers, foreign ministers, a new market, an emerging market of 80 million Iranians. So there is obviously going to be a flood of imports, but there is also investment. There is, uh, 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 they're quite open about it. They're saying we have an educated, uh, skilled working class, which is open for uh, work, right? So you invest, you rebuild, you restart, for example, the car uh, manufacturing plants as when France was involved in that, or you start other assembly plants, and we have this skilled, um, literate working class. This working class is under unbelievable rules in terms of labor legislation. It cannot form its own unions, it cannot form its own trade unions, it cannot even form any type of assembly in its workforce. It is deprived of the right to strike, and it will take low wages. So you can see the um, how much how this is going to be very good for Europeans. For Europeans, this is a good place to invest. Uh, a new place, it might not last long, but who cares? In terms of short-term economic policies, this is maximum exploitation, very little workers' rights, increased profit. And this seems to be the driving force behind uh, the reformist camp in Europe. But in the end, the left still hopes there's a deal. Does it think that maybe the opposition will be able to uh, work uh, better if there's no threat from the external forces? Very true. First of all, apart from anything else, the excuse that the economic problems are only because of sanctions will be lifted. So no one can say the situation is terrible, but what can we do? there are sanctions. Those types of sentiments, increased nationalism, increased patriotism, they're uh, uh, they no good to the working class. It does not help the situation. In fact, it lends us the life of the Islamic Republic. So those excuses will go. As I said earlier, basic demands, such as the shortage of certain food items, shortage of medication, the terrible situation in Iranian hospitals, the fact that Iranian planes uh, fly with uh, redundant spare parts will be lifted. Those issues will be resolved. There is no doubt. So as the left, we can't, uh, we can't uh, uh, but be happy that a deal has been done. But let us not be fooled by those who think, A, this is a victory for Iran. It isn't a victory for Iran. Uh, B, those who believe that uh, the economic um, intervention of the West will bring human rights or better situation for the working class. I want to thank you very much for this interview. It was excellent. Thank you very much. I've been speaking with Yasmin Mather from London. Thank you all for listening.